This video is sponsored by Space Rocket Lab. More on that later. The SpaceX Starship V2 is now 0 for 2 as the upper stage vehicle yet again explodes in outer space and rains down as a fireworks display over the Bahamas. So, why did that happen again? That's what everyone wants to know, so let's see if we can figure it out. Earlier in the week, we saw a little bit of drama around the launch procedure. On Monday night, the ship was fueled and prepped for launch. SpaceX took the countdown all the way to a scheduled hold at T-40 seconds, and then at that point made the decision to stand down for the day. This was largely attributed to pressure issues in the ground system. There are mechanical systems in the launch mount that use pressurized gas to spin up the Raptor engine turbo pumps in the Super Heavy booster prior to engine ignition, so if you don't have good pressure, you're probably not going to get a good launch. That makes sense. On the pre-launch livestream Thursday night, our presenter talked about software and hardware issues that had popped up on the ship during the Monday attempt, and as a result of that, we saw SpaceX de-stack the Starship on Wednesday. The stream presenter says that repairs were done inside of the ship during that time when it was on the ground. That might not be important, but it's something to keep in mind. There was also a really interesting segment in the pre-flight show about the new Raptor V3 engine, and that's going to become very important a bit later on, so just hold that thought. More relevant to what we're talking about right now is the outcome of Starship Flight 7 in January. We lost sight of the ship as it was nearing the end of its second stage engine burn, or what was left of its engines. We'd slowly watch them shut down one by one before the video feed cut out. Then minutes later, people on the island southeast of Florida began to spot a glowing red cloud of debris raining down from the sky. As always, SpaceX calls this a learning experience, and what they learned was that the ship experienced a much stronger harmonic response during flight than it had experienced during testing. What they're talking about here is the vibration created by the rocket engines, more specifically, the frequency of that vibration, which is just how slow or fast the ship is vibrating. A giant metal tube with six rocket engines at the bottom is going to vibrate a lot. That is expected, but if you get the wrong frequency or the wrong combination of different frequencies impacting each other, those vibrations can put a lot of stress on critical hardware, like the propellant system, and then the ship can literally vibrate itself to death, which is what we saw in January. So, with that knowledge, SpaceX took the ship intended for Flight 8 and put it through an extended length static fire test. They burned all six engines on the ground for 60 seconds, about 10 times longer than any previous static fire. They used a range of throttle settings to try and induce different frequencies of vibration to see how the ship responded. The SpaceX presenters said that this engine test led to the development of new hardware that was installed in the fuel feed lines to the ship's vacuum engines, the three near the edge with the big nozzles. The feed lines are like straws that run from the methane tank down through the liquid oxygen tank and send fuel directly into the vacuum engines. Our presenter says that the new hardware was successful in significantly lowering the strength of the harmonic resonance and relieving the extra stress on the prop system. SpaceX also looked at the location where fire broke out on Flight 7, the attic, an unpressurized area just above the engine nozzles and below the oxygen tank. The presenters say that Starship Flight 2 also had a problem with fire in this area, so in response, SpaceX took measures to make this section more resilient to leaks, adding a strong purge system that uses gaseous nitrogen to clear the area of any flammable material. SpaceX also added more vent holes to help gas escape and keep the pressure as close to vacuum as possible, which should make it harder to catch fire as well. They do mention that none of these measures are intended to be a permanent fix. This is all a stopgap measure until we get to Raptor 3, but we're not there yet. So, with all of that in mind, let's get down to it. Imagine having the thrill of a rocket launch right on your desk. Space Rocket Lab makes it possible with their stunning 3D printed models of iconic rockets and the engines that power them like this Raptor 3. This model showcases the intricate details of one of the most advanced rocket engines, giving space enthusiasts and dreamers alike an up-close view of this engineering marvel. With bundles that include the spaceship, booster, and launch pad, Space Rocket Lab lets you bring the entire launch experience into any space. 
perfect for inspiring children, surprising a friend, or adding a unique piece to your own collection. These models aren't just visually captivating, they are built with durable materials and designed for easy assembly, making them ideal for collectors, space lovers, or anyone inspired by exploration. And here is an exclusive offer. Use the coupon code THESPACERACE at checkout to get 10% off your order, but you have to act fast because this exclusive promo ends in just 5 days. Check out the link in the description and start building your own mini space fleet today. The Starship launch was as beautiful as ever. We had clear blue sky with that early evening sunlight, all 33 booster engines fired up and burned strong through the ascent phase. Hot staging was a little different this time around. Usually the super heavy booster will push over to the side as it flips around, whereas this time it did more of a straight up backflip. So when the boost back burn kicked in, it was pointed straight at the ship. You can see this at T plus two minutes, 50 seconds. The exhaust from the booster washes over the side of the Starship. Also notice that two of the booster engines failed to relight for the boost back. This is interesting because in their blog post prior to Flight 8, SpaceX wrote that they had installed upgraded engine igniters on the Super Heavy booster to provide more consistent relight performance. Anyway, that didn't prevent the booster from achieving another flawless return to launch site and catch with the Mechazilla Tower, even though one of the same engines again failed to relight for the landing burn. And now for the second time in a row, as we are marveling at the Super Heavy booster safely cradled in the chopstick arms, something terrible is happening in space. When SpaceX cuts back to camera views from the ship, we get this really cool new angle from inside the engine bay at T plus 7 minutes 44 seconds, which provides a great view of the flames licking down from above the engine nozzles. It's subtle, but there's definitely fire and we can see one particular hotspot down at the bottom left of the screen. Behind the illustration of the booster, on the nozzle of a vacuum engine, glowing bright orange. Between 8 minutes 4 seconds and 8 minutes 5 seconds, things go wrong really fast. According to the telemetry, one vacuum engine goes down, which seems to trigger an immediate chain reaction that takes out two of the center engines. At 8.06, the rear wing camera gives us a great view of the flash from an explosion in the engine bay and a burst of gas that seems to coincide with the loss of a third center engine. At the same moment, the ship begins to rapidly spin out of control. As this is happening, we hear a call out from the flight controller. Ship FTS is safed. That's the flight termination system. Safed means that the automatic triggering of the FTS is shut down. Safing FTS is normal to do once the ship is clear of any populated areas, and you can still trigger the self-destruct manually at any time. This next part is really fascinating to watch, if not a little nauseating, because those two remaining engines continue to burn as the ship is spinning out of control. We can see the telemetry reacting in real time. The propellant levels are wildly swinging up and down as the liquid sloshed back and forth through the tanks. The speed keeps accelerating and decelerating up and down as those burning engines are pushing it in every direction. At 9.10, another engine goes down, leaving us with just one Raptor that hangs on until 9.27. So, why would SpaceX not shut down all engines at the first sign of a catastrophic failure? I don't know. Maybe they lost total control over that system, maybe they just wanted to let it ride and see what happened. There's an interesting moment at the 47 minute mark of the live stream where they show a camera feed from the SpaceX launch control room. You can see a computer monitor up in the top left. The guy is looking at multiple camera views all at once, then he zooms in on one camera that looks to be pointed directly at an engine, which then pretty violently explodes. So that's an interesting detail. If you look at the weather radar feed from this moment, we can actually see exactly where the Starship broke up it's that passing anomaly from the left of the screen. So this happened while over the gulf just off the southwest tip of Florida. Here's what that looked like from the ground. This is video posted to X by Trevor Malman. We can see the ship erupting into a huge cloud of gas. Out of that cloud, there's one bright dot that continues tumbling forward. This is video of that final Starship death spiral that was filmed from the ground through a telescope. Credit to Astronomy Live for this. From the chatter in the video, we know that this is the moment when Starship was down to just one engine remaining. So 
What we're looking at here is the events that followed the live stream cutoff. The ship continues to spin and lose propellant, which is vaporizing into gas in the vacuum of space. There's a lot of fire surrounding the wreck, and we can see all of the little specks of debris forming around what's left of the ship. You can see the atmospheric re-entry begin when the spiral shape turns into something that looks like a comet. That's the air pressure starting to direct the flow of gas. So we can gather that the big burst happened before telemetry with the ship was lost. That could be flight termination, or it could have been another explosion inside the engine bay. The ship appeared to re-enter the atmosphere as one large mass with a small cloud of debris around it, so that wouldn't necessarily point to FTS, which is supposed to tear the body of the rocket wide open to release all of the propellant. And again, our final view of the ship comes from the Bahamas, a cluster of flaming debris streaking across the late evening sky. If any of what we just described sounds familiar, it's because the exact same thing happened to Flight 7 at the exact same time during the flight. SpaceX said that they fixed it. So far, the response from SpaceX has been pretty generic. They made a post on X that essentially just pointed out the obvious. During Starship's ascent burn, the vehicle experienced a rapid unscheduled disassembly, and contact was lost. Elon Musk wrote in a reply on X that was unusually somber, quote, it was an upper stage ship failure to be honest, but we learned a good amount in building the new ship design and the flight. Elon followed that up with, Today was a minor setback, progress is measured by time, the next ship will be ready in four to six weeks. So, at this point it's not clear what SpaceX could change to prevent that same thing from happening a third time. They seemed to be pretty confident about solving the issue prior to Thursday, but clearly they did not. So it's looking more and more like the real fix for the problem is Raptor 3. SpaceX kind of gave this away during the pre-flight show. Chris from Hawthorne, California came on the show to talk specifically about the Raptor engine. He talks about how SpaceX is constantly improving their engine designs using something they call the algorithm. He says that this algorithm helps engineers to question the requirements of the engine, find the parts that they don't need, and then optimize the design. You can see this at work with the progression from Raptor 1, which never actually flew to space, then Raptor 2, which is currently used on Starship and the booster, and Raptor 3. This new design eliminates the unnecessary components and moves as many of the parts as possible from the outside of the engine to the inside. Chris says that potentially the biggest advantage of Raptor 3 is that it will allow SpaceX to remove the engine heat shields from the thrust section. That adds up to removing around one metric ton of mass per engine. So across the entire ship and booster, that's saving 39 tons of weight, which basically means that Starship can then carry 39 tons more mass to orbit, which that alone is about double the maximum payload capacity of a Falcon 9. So that's cool, but a little later on in the stream, when the hosts are talking about how to prevent catastrophic fires from breaking out in the future, they mention that with the next generation of the ship and the use of the Raptor 3 engine, the volume of the attic compartment is going to be reduced. While most of the fuel lines and joints on the engines themselves will be eliminated, parts can't leak if they don't exist. SpaceX says that the transition to Raptor 3 will come later this year, and from all of the information that we have to work with, all signs point to this new engine system being the solution to almost all of the problems that we've seen so far. Even more reason to pick up your own model of the Raptor 3 from today's sponsor.